Okay, we're going to take a look at a very obscure game called Mohawk. And it's from an even more obscure company, the Olic Council. I don't think I even have a year for this. Yes, I do. It was um, published in 1983. And the designer was Tom Lobuck and Rick Bowes. Now, I don't know a darn thing about the Olic Council. I know they're not around, and this game is rather rare. But the subject is the Seven Years' War in North America, or the French and Indian War as it's known in the States. Now I'm going to show you some of the components and the board, tell you a little bit about the game, and um, take this little review, you might say, with a grain of salt. This has got some neat artwork on the cover, but the graphics, well, I'm going to call them cute. They're, they're quite different. But I like the game enough that I actually went to Staples and um, redid the map, had it blown up. Because the map itself is very, very small. Take a look and uh, try not to laugh. It's, um, it's kind of cute, you might say. Alright, so the general map is North America as it was in the time of the uh, Seven Years' War. So you've got Alexandria, Virginia down here, um, Baltimore, New York, New Haven, and Boston, and the main post road. Of course, Lake George, Lake Champlain, there's the St. Lawrence, Lake Ontario, Lake Erie, Lake Michigan, Lake Huron. And over here, the Gulf of St. Lawrence, and uh, Cape Breton Island, where the Fortress of Lewisburg is. So, um, uh, the map certainly is unusual. Now on it, are, it's a point-to-point -point game. So you've got these points, the little circles mean towns, the little wee um, triangles being Indian villages. And uh, on the side here, you have these six, well actually five, different tactical terrain boards. And the idea being, uh, being a point-to-point -point game, that when you moved your forces from one point to another and the enemy forces were there, you had a combat. Then you went to this little tactical table to um, fight out the battle. And that's where the game was kind of innovative. For example, if the enemy came by a water and attacked Albany, Albany being a town, you'd fight out the battle on this little wee tactical town graphic. And if you assaulted a fortification, well, you'd fight out the battle on this little wee fortification graphic. And each of these graphics altered the uh, combat slightly. For example, uh, if you fought in a wilderness space, you'd fight the battle on this little wee uh, forest uh, area. And there'd be appropriate modifiers. Now, one of the really neat things about the game, I thought it was very innovative, was this um, strategic little map here. And I'll get to that in a moment and we'll zoom in on it. Okay, another thing um, about the game I should mention. It paints the uh, French and Indian War with a very broad brush. But it actually started in 1754, which I thought was kind of neat. So it um, covers the period of the um, Jumonville Affair. 1759, of course, is the Braddock and Lake George campaign. 1756 is Fort Oswego that kind of thing. 1757 is uh, Fort William Henry, 1758 Louisburg, 1759 Quebec, and of course the eventual end of the war. Uh, so each turn represents about six months. Like I said, so it's the war painted with a very broad brush. Now the counters to the game were very, very simple. I mean laughably simple. For example, the green units just had the Indian tribe's name on it, in this case Chippewa, and uh, number 17, just a uh, numerical designation. So all the Indians were the same, green. The colony militia were white with a blue stripe, and uh, you had the Troupe de la Marine, also white with a blue stripe, and then you had the French regulars, white with a blue stripe with a trace of gold on them. That's the regiment La Rien. The British were similar, except that they were red, of course, with a gold stripe and the name of the regiment. And there was um, fortification counters, blue for the French, flip side, red for the English. And then on the strategic map, oh yeah, you had these burned and destroyed counters too and you wiped out towns. Now, let's get to the ship counters 
and the way the strategic game worked. Okay, before I show you how the uh, strategic little sub-game worked, I should show you the rules. Now, the rules were very simple. We're talking a pamphlet here. So what are we talking about? One, two, three, four, five. The equivalent of five pages of rules. So we're not talking about an in-depth game here. The closest game that I can associate it with would be um, A House Divided by GDW, the Civil War game. Because it uses a very similar procedure to move. It is point-to-point -point movement, as I mentioned. But what one would do is you'd roll a die, and this would give you so many marches which you could allocate on the board. So that's how the operational game worked. But I want to show the, the strategic little sub-game up here. And that worked kind of neat. Let's take a look at that. Okay, what happened with this little wee sub-game here was the French had four fleets. And each of them had different names on the back. For example, they had a gifts and supplies fleet, a naval squadron, a troop convoy, and a privateer squadron. The British had a troop convoy, a sea lift capacity, appointments and supplies, and a naval squadron. And what would happen is, at a certain phase in the game, usually at the beginning of the year, the French would place each of his fleets on Toulon, Rochefort, Brest and Louisbourg. The uh, British player would then place his fleets on the same places. Okay. Of course, you'd be looking at them first and determining what your strategy would be. Then you'd flip the counters. So privateers operating out of Toulon would encounter a troop convoy. Then you'd cross-hatch a result to see what effect that would have on the operational game. For example, if this troop convoy, British, got through to North America, then the British would have more troops available to them that year. For example, off of uh, Brest here, uh, a naval squadron would encounter the sea lift and that would probably cancel it. I haven't looked at the actual results here. And for example, appointments and supplies or a troop convoy. Depending on what convoy arrived in the New World, that would affect things on the operational game. So for example, if tr uh, appointments, appointments and supplies or gifts and supplies for the French arrived in North, North America okay, then uh, the Indians would be quite happy. They'd have lots of um, gifts and supplies, and then more Indian units would be available on the game. Um, for example, if your troop convoy did not get through to North America, then you'd have a lot less regulars that year. So this little sub-game was a brilliant way of showing how the events in Europe and at sea could affect the war on land. Now the um, combat. Let's see what that was like. Okay, battle in the game, like a lot of the point-to-point -point, uh, games, was very simple. What you did was just simply line up your units opposite the enemy units on the appropriate train. Now in this particular one, I'm just showing you, uh, let's say, a British landing by water hitting a French force on land. And it was the classic old, you know, you roll a die for each unit and hope you get a six kind of thing. So it was very simple. And when you hit the unit, it would flip to its other side. And that would show it's disrupted kind of thing. So it was a very, very simple combat system. But it was very effective for the game. And I couldn't help but notice, um, you notice how, the, how linear the game was, this old map of the Battle of the Monongahela. And again, you can see, see the linearity of the combat at the time. Um, the moving was kind of neat. Um, for example, regulars and militia using a road would have double march capacity. Um, Indians, couriers, or rangers would have double. Um, they would also have double movement on Indian trails. So the terrain actually meant something too. The map, though, ridiculous looking in a sense, uh, was actually very functional. For example, you can see the Blue River here. I guess that would be the Connecticut River. You could get enhanced movement along it. You can see the green paths. Those were Indian paths. And of course, you have the main post road here um, on the coast, the 13 colonies, which would also enhance your movement. Now, up uh, in the St. Lawrence, the French would be able to move from um, uh, Montreal, Quebec, Tadoussac along this line much more efficiently, too. And, of course, out in the west, you've got these tons of Indian tribes with the um, Indian uh, tribes we would set up on. Um, so, my criticisms of the game are um, 
the board is small. It's very small, so there's a little bit of counter clutter at times. And um, I like the game so much, I actually went to Staples and had it printed out. And um, I'm going to show you the larger version just to show it off. Uh, here's an ad for the game. Like I said, it's quite old, 1983. Um, I can't say enough good things about it. It's just a great game. If you can get your hands on it, do pick up a copy. But like I said, it's, it's rare now and it's probably... Um, you know, uh, commanding collector prices these days. But let me show you the uh, larger map that I had done. And um, I actually did some new counters too. Let's take a look. Okay, there you can see the original map from the company and then the one I had done at um, uh, Staples. So it is much larger. Now the one, the larger one is the standard kind of GMT size there. What is that? 30 six inches by 24 or something like that, 22. So um, I like the game enough to uh, actually do a larger version of the map. And I'll show you some of the counters I, I did and uh, there's, these will uh, certainly be familiar to you. Okay, those are some of the counters I made for Mohawk. Now if they look uh, familiar to you, uh, they should be. They are uh, direct rip-offs of the game Wilderness War by GMT. All I did was take the uh, graphics and remove the GMT information and uh, just left the uh, regimental designation. So you can see the, the GMT style counters are far superior to the old a la council ones. And the fleet, well I thought I could gussy it up a little bit with a nice uh, graphic of a fleet. The Indian counters certainly are better. The other ones just have the name of the tribe on. I thought we should give them a little graphic. And of course the French regulars. So, um, I mean, these are completely unauthorized. This is just for my own use. And uh, I did a whole mess of them. There's a, some of the Indian counters. And um, there's some of the uh, French regulars. And uh, like I said, with a new, larger map, the game is a lot more enjoyable to play. Well, that concludes my brief look at the game Mohawk. I will uh, have a couple of closing comments. Um, I think it's a very good game and I like it very much. Um, inevitably we're going to compare it to games like Wilderness War by GMT, which is a fine uh, simulation of the French and Indian War. And then there is for a few acres of snow, although that does cover a much wider uh, period, not just the Seven Years War. But there's things in Wilderness War um, that I'm not comfortable with. Uh, it's a good card-driven game and covers the subject fairly well, but there's a few aspects that I'm uncomfortable with, and I think Mohawk actually handled it better. I'm thinking here of the way the strategic element worked, the way you uh, had the fleets affect the outcome in North America. Well, the card-driven game, Wilderness War, um, I had a little problem with the way reinforcements work. Uh, as fine a game as that is. I still like Mohawk a lot. I would love to see it reprinted. Uh, that's not likely to happen. It's the kind of thing where I almost feel like working on my own game, doing a remake of this game, because it's so good. I think um, it can be brought up to modern day standards and made into a fine simulation. Anyway, that's my concluding remarks on Mohawk. If you get a chance to play it, uh, do so. It is a great little game. Thank you for watching.